here with Neil Murthy, all around interesting guy, excited about our conversation today. We're going to talk about intellectual curiosity, innovation, what it's like to be an entrepreneur, and whatever else we decide we're going to talk about, right, Neil? Yeah, sounds good. So uh, thanks for being on the show. Excited to have you. And we're just going to jump right into the conversation. So it'd be great to start. Just tell the audience a little bit about yourself, whatever you want to share. You've got a great background. You've been a university professor. You've been a founder. You've been involved with hundreds of startups across your career, carried lots of different titles, been involved in lots of different interesting organizations. But just tell us a little bit about who you are and yeah. what you're working on today. Yeah, you said a little, so I'll, I'll try to keep this short. Uh, so so, uh, so uh, one of the things that a lot of people like to hear is that I, uh, I actually started my first company when I was 11. And uh, so, so, so I'll tell you the quick story behind that. And so uh, I wanted to be a veterinarian more than anything in the world. And I was living in the small town in Connecticut. There was one veterinary clinic in the entire town and probably in the surrounding towns as well. And uh, this, this, uh, I was like, I'm going to be a veterinarian, but I don't know how to be a veterinarian. So I went to the clinic and I said, Hey, can you, can I just watch you? And like, you train me to be a veterinarian. Cause I thought that's how you became a veterinarian. And this guy is <laughs> veterinarian. He says, he's a really smart guy. And he says, he says, huh, it's a fall in New England. And he says, why don't you uh, come on Saturday mornings? And I got about an acre plot of land. And uh, why don't you rake up the leaves? Come at 8 a.m. We open at 9. You come at 8 a.m., rake up the leaves. And uh, once you're done with that, my assistant will come out, check out the work that you've done. And then you can come in and you can uh, watch me and shadow me. And, uh, and, I, and, and we close at 2 and we end up closing everything down at 3. Um, and I'll pay you for the whole time. And I'm like, sounds like a great deal to me. So I did that on a, on a, I did it for one Saturday and then I did it for a second Saturday and then I did it for a third Saturday. And at the end of the day on the third Saturday, I went to him and I said, I don't think I want to be a veterinarian. And he's like, why is that? And I'm like, well, you know, I love animals and all the animals that come in here are like sick and, you know, ill. And I've even seen you put some of them down. And honestly, it's just heartbreaking. And I'm glad that there are people like you, but I don't think I could be that. And he said, he's like, yeah, I, I kind of feel you. Um, and then he looks at me and he says, would you like to still come and rake up the leaves? <laughs> I said, yeah, that sounds good. So I kept coming back. And then I found out that a bunch of other people in town needed their uh, leaves raked. And so I did the sort of the Tom Sawyer white fence thing. And I, and I got all my uh, classmates from, 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 I forget what it was, like sixth grade or something like this. And I got all my classmates and I, um, and I said, Hey, why don't you go and rake these leaves and I'll give you 80% of the money and I'll take 20%. So I actually <laughs> built a legitimate business. <laughs> we had a tax ID and everything <laughs> and, uh, it was a lot of fun and, uh, you know, but that's how I got started. And uh, so I really haven't looked back ever since. I mean, you know, I've, I've built, I've built, you know, small companies and some scalable technology companies and things like this. My first professional company uh, out of college, uh, I built, it was a, a behavioral simulation company. So mm. basically my background training was as an economist and a mathematician. And so I did, uh, my senior thesis work in what's called applied game theory. And basically what I did was I modeled how people behave and, uh, decided to make a business out of that mm. and, uh, was able to do that on a larger scale and for large scale clients. And, um, and it was a ton of fun and ended up selling that company to a big global professional services company. Um, and honestly, you know, and one of the funny things about that is, is that I think it was like 11 years on. So I sold that in 2006 and as of 2017, they still didn't know what they were doing with it. <laughs> so, but you know, that wasn't my problem. Right. That sort of thing. So yeah, I've been doing that kind of stuff. As you mentioned, I, uh, I started teaching, um, in 2003 at the university of Houston, kind of a fluke thing. And, um, found that, uh, that I really enjoyed that. And so did that on and off as an adjunct professor, which means I was just doing it part-time class here or there, uh, for about 15 years, different areas, like things like, um, business economics and uh, strategy. And then most of it was in entrepreneurship. Um, and it's a really good program at the university of Houston, uh, for entrepreneurship. And, uh, and I was, had a lot of fun with that. So I did that for 15 years off and on, like I said, uh, until 2018 and I, then I kind of stopped doing that so I could do other things, but eh, who knows, maybe I'll go back to it as well. So, but yeah, it's kind of like just a hodgepodge of, of stuff. <laughs> well, you've been around entrepreneurs 
for much of your life, you've been one, you've, you've, uh, sat in that chair and been in those shoes. Um, you, I'd be interested to kind of get your take. I mean, really interesting, uh, kind of mix of experiences and you're working on a number of different businesses now, which we'll get into. And so kind of want to get your take on just kind of entrepreneurialism and how generally entrepreneurs think about the world differently. Kind of your take, you've, you've, studied human behavior and the impacts and in, on innovative thinking and, and community building and, and those kinds of interactions. And so maybe if you could just spend a couple of minutes of talking about some of the things that you find particularly interesting and that have sort of standed the test of time, you know, withstood the test of time, if you will, that, that seem to have kind of proven themselves out again and again. Yeah. I mean, I'm happy to talk about it. I don't, I don't know that I have a whole lot of wisdom around that. It's uh, one thing I'll, I'll, I'll say is, is that I think that a lot of people that are not in entrepreneurship, um, and, and there are probably a lot of people who are in entrepreneurship, think of entrepreneurship or being an entrepreneur as a, I don't know how to describe this, as a, as a thing, like it's a profession or something like that. And I don't think that it's, it's so much that as it is a, a mindset. Um, and I think that virtually everybody can have an entrepreneurial mindset. Um, and I don't know that I can be you know, properly analytical about this and like really kind of delineate what it is to have an entrepreneurial mindset, but it's inclusive of things like um, going out there and knowing that you're, you're going to put something out into the world that isn't perfect. There's a, there's a turn of phrase that, that I like, and I've heard others use um, that says, uh, you know, if, if you're an entrepreneur or, or startup or whatever, and uh, what you put out is perfect, then you're putting it out too late. And, and, and I, and I, it's a, it's about that willingness to, uh, to, to do something and to put yourself out there and to put, you know, your products out there or your business out there, um, in a way that, uh, that, you know, is less than perfect. Um, and, and that's really important because it's through that process that you also learn more and make that thing better. Um, I think that that's really important. It's also, and this kind of goes along with that. I think it's also about, uh, uh, you know, you have to be willing to take um, a certain amount of of personal and professional risk. Um, and frankly, you know, and, and you talked about study of human behavior. Most people are not, I don't, I don't know if it's what you're born with or just how you're raised. I, I, I'm not going to answer that question. But most people are just generally risk averse. We, we live in a society, especially in, in, in the United States, but we live in a society in which we're trained to be kind of generally risk averse, um, you know, there's, there's stuff that you do and, and the stuff that you don't do. And there's certain liabilities attached to that. But in addition to that, you know, we go through like an educational system and that educational system is here's, here's some information. And then I'm going to ask you uh, a question and then you're going to give me an answer, but that's not the way the world works. And that's certainly not the way that entrepreneurship works. Nobody gives you the question. You're actually out there seeking the question. And, and that's the case for a lot of professions, but entrepreneurship is 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 one of those paths for which that's I think very real. So you have to go. You have to be willing to go out there um, and seek the questions, and then seek to answer the questions in ways that are less than perfect, and take risks associated with that. And I don't think that most people. I'm not saying most people aren't suited for that, but I don't think that most people. That's that's who they are intrinsically, um, and so they have to overcome that uh, the, the, that 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 risk aversion to go out there and, uh, and, 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 and be maybe what they want to be. But I honestly think that that's also the case for a lot of other things too. It's just, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a big challenge in our world to find who you are, um, and, 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 and just explore, hmm. explore our society or explore, um, and, and maybe the, the, the greatest exploration is the, the exploration of self-awareness and, um, and finding out, you know, who, who, who you are at your core. And then, and then finding a way to, uh, to sort of manifest that um, in the world, you know, be that person. That's, that's a really, really difficult thing. And again, that has nothing to do with being, for example, I mean, it's related, but it's, but it's, not, it's not solely about being a, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the originator of a business, a founder, mm -hmm. right? That's not about that. Again, it's about an entrepreneurial mindset. So you can you can be that person and work for a large corporation, or you can be that person and be an artist, 
or you can be that person and be a professor or you, whatever it is. You can, or you can be that person and be, you know, um, uh, somebody who works in, with, in manual labor because that's, enjo- that's what you enjoy or that's what you know how to do. But, but, it, but exploring that for yourself and finding that who you are and then, and then, and then being willing to take the risks to, to be that person better. Kind of that mentality and willingness to look at the world through yeah. a bit of a different lens. Absolutely, and, and absolutely. A and, it's, and, and it's really, really hard. I, I've mentioned the kind of the schooling system and such, but, but it's really hard because I, I don't think that our society, the American society, in terms of what we might think of as actual entrepreneurs, those who actually create businesses and such like this, it's done a very, very good job, better than probably any other society on earth, to, um, uh, how do I say, cultivate that. Hmm. But... But it still doesn't do a good job of it. it doesn't do a great job of it. Um, we 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 put up barriers and constraints for people to find themselves and to express themselves and things like this for virtually everybody. Um, and so to overcome that, to overcome those societal limitations and the constraints and the expectations and things like this, is I think a really really difficult thing. There's this. Uh, so uh, you know. Uh, those of you who are listening on just listening and not, not, you can't see me, but just to let you know, I'm, I'm a brown skinned individual. My, my, my family is originally from India. My parents were born in India. My brother was born in India. I was born here in, in Dallas, but, um, my, you know, being an Indian American, um, especially somebody who is a sort of upper middle class or, or kind of higher social strata or whatever, socioeconomic strata, um, there's, there's an expectation of what career path you're going to take. And for, for me and my family, that what, what, I, what I always tell people is um, there were three career paths that were available to me. I could be a doctor, I could be an engineer, or I could be a disgrace to the family. <laughs> and, and that's the way it is for a lot of people. We're a nation of immigrants. Um, and the world is just a world of immigrants. I mean, a lot of people are immigrants just wherever they are and wherever they come from. And, uh, and, and they have their certain societal and cultural expectations that come from family expectations and whatever the societal structure that they're in and things like this. And just to overcome those things is a huge challenge for anyone. But I will say that I think that I, I feel like I have sort of, I don't know that I've, I've done that sufficiently, but, uh, but, I, but I feel like I'm, I'm on that path. And it's a wonderful path to be on. Um, to just find yourself to to explore that. I haven't found myself yet, but I I, I feel like I've I've enjoyed the journey so far. Yeah, that's wild. I mean, it it really seems like it, it, what you're describing is that kind of entrepreneurialism. Though universities teach it, you taught it at a university. It's it's really not something to sort of like academically learn. It's something to experientially learn. It's funny. I was actually known at the University of Houston for being the professor of entrepreneurship. I taught these like low level classes, so you know, sophomore classes and such like this. Mm-hmm. And I was known for I, t- I taught these large classes because you know, I mean, I wasn't like a tenured professor and like this. I was the lowest rung on the totem pole here. <laughs> and so, so, but uh, but when I went into class on the first day of my my entrepreneurship class, my general entrepreneurship classes. Um, I would always tell my students, I said, I said, look, I know that you're taking this class, but I'm going to tell you that I don't think that I nor nor anyone else can teach you entrepreneurship. Hmm. My job here will be to help you to learn entrepreneurship by creating and facilitating an environment in which you can do so um, safely um, and with a bit of reduced risk. Um, and so, so, but but, but yeah, I, 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 I've, I've kind of cringed and and I know you didn't mean to mean it that way, but I kind of cringe when anybody says like I taught entrepreneurship or (laughs) entrepreneurship is taught or anything like this. It's just, no, no entrepreneurship might be learned. It might be encultured, but it is not, uh, but it's not something that I think that anybody can really teach. It's just something you create that environment and maybe at best. And I think it's really important to sort of the, the premise of the show here, this kind of carbon curiosity podcast is this idea around curiosity and intellectual curiosity and just sort of this, this constant drive and interest to sort of learn through doing Yeah, and, and really having that just kind of constant itch. And, and so it's one of the reasons why I'm excited that you're here because you, you, you've thought deeply about these, these kinds of nuances and we're using sort of entrepreneurship as kind of like a proxy for, for, for curiosity, because you really cannot take that step to being an entrepreneur without truly being curious about sort of the world around you and how to make something better and how to kind of improve that. Yeah. 
um, for someone who's who's spent a lot of time with entrepreneurs, you've mentored entrepreneurs, you've um, you've done a lot of things there. Are there are there sort of common themes that you sort of bump into in terms of people that you kind of just know like mm, they're probably not going to be a very successful entrepreneur, or they they this this individual is going to probably do well because they've got kind of they've they've got a higher get it factor related to yeah. I, I, so so years ago, I kind of developed this uh, framework, and it was more about. Um, mentoring entrepreneurs, um, kind of like telling them like, look, this is kind of how you got to think mm. a little bit at, as an entrepreneur. Um, but, but I think that, uh, it, it may be useful, uh, in also in sort of assessing entrepreneurs going to your question. Um, I call it the three A's of entrepreneurship. And so, so the, I say that there's, there's three A's. The, the first one is audacity, which I define in this context as, um, your, your ability and willingness uh, to just continue moving along a certain path um, despite uh, your failures. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, I, then I, the next A is awareness. And awareness I define as uh, the uh, ability and willingness to, to change your path despite your successes. And the third one, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. sorry, I meant, I, I apologize. Let's start over again on that. Sure. Um, yeah. So, so the the the, um, the first A is audacity, uh, which is the uh, ability and willingness to uh, uh, to continue along a certain path um, despite one's failures. Like, um, and then the, the second one uh, is what I call adaptability, hmm. um, which is the uh, ability and willingness to uh, to change a path despite one's successes. And the third one is uh, what I call awareness, and awareness is really a self awareness of knowing when to be audacious and when to be adaptive. Hmm. And if a person has all three of those traits, I have found that they can be successful in entrepreneurship as defined maybe narrowly, building a business and such like this, uh, or entrepreneurship even being defined uh, much more broadly. So for example, within a corporation or something like that, right. um, uh, uh, or, or, or anything, uh, just having that mindset. But I think that that's kind of the pillars of the mindset um, the, in my mind is, is, is just that, is, is the ability to, to express yourself along these sort of three, along these three, with, along these, uh, in a way that's aligned with these three pillars. Maybe. Have you found that there are ways for individuals to be, enhance those capabilities in themselves or assess those capabilities in themselves? You know, part of the goal of the podcast is for the audience to kind of be more intellectually curious to kind of ask different kinds of questions. Is that sort of a learnable skill or it's kind of like, Hey, I'm, you've either, you've, you certainly have kind of an aptitude to kind of start with or an interest or, you know, but just be curious if there are, if there are ways that, that you have seen that kind of enhance somebody's interest or ability or willingness to be audacious or to, to, to drive adaptability, or if it's just kind of a, um, I think, I think it's a, I, yeah, I, I, I think that there, it is, but I think that it comes from a, at its root, I think that it comes from a place of humility, hmm. you know, sort of an, uh, um, it's, it's funny. Uh, I, I find that the people who are most successful in general, um, but, but, um, but specifically within the context of the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial mindset or being entrepreneurs in a narrow sense, um, I find that they, uh, just have, they, they often have, um, what is that? What is that phrase? Uh, they have, um, oh shoot, you know, I'm having a bit of a brain fart here. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know why I'm not thinking of this. Maybe you can edit this out. <laughs> <laughs> no, we will be fine. Right? Uh, it's called, uh, what do they call that? Shoot, I knew it. I know it was on the top tip of my tongue. We can always imposter syndrome. Oh, so, sure. So, so you know, I, I find that if I, I find that these these very successful um, entrepreneurs and others have imposter syndrome. They often feel it. Um, they may not express it, hmm. um, and, and in fact, they may they might seek to defend themselves um, from from anybody being aware of it. But they but but I find that they almost always have um, imposter syndrome. And I think that that comes from a place of, of humility. Uh, they, you know, they're like, well, why am I the best person to mm. be doing this? And one of my best friends called me up. Um, she, she's, a, she has been an entrepreneur, but, but, but in this particular context, she actually got a job. 
She was working for a, a, a essentially a startup. She calls me up and she says, I don't know, but I feel this imposter syndrome. I just, I just, I don't know what to feel. I don't know what to think. I mean, I, I've been in this role for a week. And what I told her, and I think this applies to all of these people, is recognize that you are an imposter. It's, just it's, accept it. just accept it. Because it, it's, 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 it's the height of arrogance to believe that you truly are the best person to be doing something. But the reason why you're in that chair, the reason why you are, in a sense, the best person to do it is because you're doing it. Hmm. So what I think it requires is uh, a humility to say, I'm going to do this. This is my responsibility. This is my duty. This is what I'm here to do right now. Somebody has asked me to do this or the world has asked me to do this and I'm just going to do it. And I'm going to do it for as long as I'm the best person doing it. And if somebody else better comes along, I'm going to step out of them and get out of this chair and I'm going to let them sit down. Hmm. And I think that that's where it comes from. And if you have that, I think that you can learn those three A's or all the other stuff. I, th I think so. It's about, it, it, one might call it a open-mindedness. Mm. Um, but I think it comes from a place of, yeah, it's open-mindedness, self-awareness. Um, but ultimately it's just, I think, I, I don't know if it's the best phrase or best term to use, but I think it's, I think humility is a good phrase to use there. Very cool. Well, thank you for kind of unpacking some of that for us. I think it's, uh, I think it's really fascinating. And I think it's, you know, it's, there's kind of a, you say, there's really not a better time right now than to start a business. And there's a lot of people that are sort of thinking about that. And, yeah. um, you know, there's a lot of uh, churn and uncertainty and things kind of just out in the world generally. D and so there is, I will say this, like we're in Houston, Texas, mm -hmm. and um, there's a lot of questions around um, why it's such a large city. You've got such a massive population, a large technical population um, and why, um, why we don't have a stronger, we have a decent, but, but why we don't have a stronger startup scene mm. here and I honestly think that a part of that is because we have a fair, you know, the, the things that our city leaders uh, and, and the PR agencies and everything like this talk about Houston. Well, it's, it's, it's a stable work environment that we have a good economy and everything like this. And I'm not saying that you, to be an entrepreneur, you have to be a software developer. I mean, there's lots of different ways to build businesses and such like this. But as an example, we have a ton of software developers in this city but they all have relatively cushy jobs working for major oil and <laughs> gas companies or healthcare companies or whatever it happens to be. And, 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 you know, they shouldn't be uh, bemoaned for that or anything sure. like this. They, they, that's, that's, that, that's, that's who they are and that's what they want and things like this. But I think that a lot of, if you look historically at a lot of these uh, hotbeds of uh, startup innovation and such like this regionally, um, a lot of those went through um, economic upheaval mm. uh, and and people were like, well, I have nothing better to do. So I might as well create a Some company. type of external catalyst. Yeah, to sort of something get them like out this. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so I agree with you uh, that, that, um, you know, that, that, that may be a place where the drive comes from to some degree, but I think that there's also the case that it's, it's not just about Houston. It's, 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 uh, you know, but I, th I think that, you know, when you, it, to kind of sometimes you have to pull yourself out of that, uh, that comfort zone. Sure. And sometimes that's that, that something else pulls you out of that comfort zone. Um, but if you want to do that for yourself, I think that you have to just pull yourself up by the bootstraps and just get out of the, the chair. That's the comfy, you know, lazy boy or whatever it is. And then go sit on a hard wooden chair for a little while and say, Hey, you know, this is what I'm going to do because I'm just, I, I need to be uncomfortable to be able to create. Yeah. Right. And, uh, it's in, in and 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 actually it's funny because I think ultimately creativity happens um and creation happens um at the opposite ends of sort of the comfort spectrum. Mm. That it happens it happens when we're at our most uncomfortable and it happens sort of the you know, sort of necessity is the mother of invention and, and these sorts of ideas. Um and then it also happens when we're extremely comfortable, when we can sit and process the information mm. uh that we've acquired uh and such. But, but, you know, I was talking with one of my co-founders the other day and, uh, I was like, look, you know, I think that you can do this and, 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 uh, and, and, you know, I want, I want, you know, I want you to succeed and I want to, uh, to do what I can to support you in succeeding. But I think that, you know, you don't need to sit at your desk, 
um, and, and work on the stuff, go and go take a bike ride or, or go, you know, when you, the, your moments of clarity might come when you're on your morning run. And two hours later, after we had that conversation, he texts me and he says, uh, he says, you know, it just happened. I was uh, walking my son. He's got a small son. He was mm -hmm. on a, in a stroller. He was I wa I wa walking with my son, and I had that moment of clarity. And so it can come from both both sides of that. But I think I don't th honestly think I don't really see it coming in the middle. Sure. You know that, that that creativity, that creation, and such like this. I don't see. I mean, for some people it could. Yeah. But in general, for most people, I think I think it comes from one of those two. Ends Caught of up the in spectrum. the churn of life, and you're kind of just you know you get into kind of a routine. And yeah. And I think that's also probably by extension a bit of why you see entrepreneurs being very mission driven because they've identified sort of a passion to kind of motivate them. They've latched onto that thing and they've had that moment of clarity that sort of gets them up and out of that chair. And so they've got sort of a mission to accomplish. And so I want to kind of steer the discussion a sure. little bit because I know you're you're working to solve on a couple a, a, a few different things right now. Yeah. And so I want to talk a bit about uh, you know, a couple of the companies that, that you're thinking about and, and, and some of the missions that you're solving for. And so, uh, we didn't really talk about which one to start with, but I know that you're working on, you can go to alphabetical order if you want. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> well, so take us from the top, um, and, uh, kind of tell us a little bit about, um, you know, whichever one you want to start with and, yeah. uh, yeah. So, tell us so a bit about the mission and before, before I get into that, I'll yeah. tell you this, um, and something that I, I don't think, you know, Scott, is that uh, I actually have a couple of binders on my bookshelf uh, at home uh, that are large binders, like you know the three inch binders, mm -hmm. and they have uh, they have just tons of like mostly bad business ideas, <laughs> you know. Like I just I had a flash of insight at some point or something like this, or somebody said something, and you know I, I recognized a problem or or possibly you know a solution that might be tied to a problem or something like this, mm -hmm. and. Uh, years ago, I developed a, a template uh, for uh, how to capture some of these ideas, and I put together like a one-page template that I could literally write on. I didn't need to even like type on it or something like this, so I just printed out like a ton of these sheets and and I put it in this binder, and then <laughs> and then uh, and then and I and I filled it out by hand. I could just jot, jot down some notes or whatever it is, and that yeah. way later on, I'll tell you this: like one of the uh, one of the great regrets. I don't I don't actually have regrets, if you will, but 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 I'll I'll call it a regret uh, for shorthand. Uh, is that I had this, I, I know I had this, what I considered to be a brilliant idea. Um, and I know I called it Pangea, you mm. know, like the ancient continent. Sure. I have no idea what Pangea is. I have no idea what the idea was. I'm sure it was like <laughs> just the most name. brilliant thing. I just remember that it was called Pangea. And so it was actually after that, that I created this binder. Cause I was like, I'm never going to miss another one of these ideas mm. again. And now <laughs> I think there's something on the order of about 800 ideas across like three binders that's awesome uh, at home and so that's actually where a lot of uh what i'm doing now came from actually mm -hmm. originally um uh, initially um so so uh, uh one of the companies and and the first one uh that i started of of the three that i'm working on right now uh is uh which is called solver x um it's kind of a quasi accelerator basically the intention behind it um is to work with universities um and um uh, identify uh, a piece of intellectual property that they have that mm. th that they think that it could be valuable, but they just haven't been able to license or commercialize because maybe it's in a, a raw state, something like that. And then what we do is we go find a, a corporate partner um, who could potentially use like a final or finished product around this intellectual property. And then we run an accelerator-like program with a bunch of individuals who compete on teams and such like this. And mm. then they then they build a, a prototype and if the and whatever the successful winning team is we take that team we uh, fund them we incorporate them we take that prototype we help to fund it to kind of its commercialization and uh you know it's a, it's basically an investment deal for us and, and our fund um but but we do that well that idea uh actually i i, I started that company a couple of years ago in a formal sense um, and, uh, you know, kind of been working on it on the side for a while. I really started working on it this year, but, but was working on the side, but that idea actually came about, um, something like, I don't remember how, I mean, and, and, and frankly, COVID has kind of like, I think changed all of our perceptions of time here <laughs> sure. and our memories and such, but I think it was roughly around nine years ago or so. And I, uh, I was interested in, uh, just how universities are, 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 uh, commercializing their IP. 
Yep. And I found out based on the study that I, that I had commissioned, I found out that um, roughly about 2% across the globe of university held and, and generated intellectual property is actually licensed um, in any way, shape 2%. or form. 2%, roughly 2%. By volume. By volume. Some universities are a bit better than others, obviously, and things like this. But yeah, but just by volume, hmm. 2%. And I was like, wow, that seems like a real loss a to civilization, to humanity, to the universities, you know. And so, so, that, so, so it took me about seven years to kind of think through that. And I, I put, jotted down some ideas around it and such like this on this, on this, in this binder. And uh, it took me about seven years to kind of like really kind of think about you know, and, and, and it's actually funny. We were having that other conversation about like being in a comfort zone. I was actually on a bike ride um, when it finally all sort of came together mm. for me. Um, and, and even then I didn't have like a, a business model or business plan or like this, but I kind of had an idea of what the actual like program. It crystallized. Model, like, kind of crystallized for me. And, and I think that, uh, so that's, that's kind of, that's kind of one of the things that I'm working on, but that's how that particular one uh, came about mm. uh, is, you know, it just took, years of sort of like, you know, back burner processing in my brain of, 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 of what the problem was and, uh, you know, what might be a possible solution around it. And, and, uh, you know, I don't even know if it's, if it's the right solution yet, you know, but, but kind of going back to the conversation we were having earlier, I'm willing to take the risk. I'm willing to go out there and just kind of put out this like unfinished thing sure. and say, what do you think world? Right. You know, start like, iterating. You know, There's a okay? real problem. And, here. Yeah. How yeah. Do we and, start chipping away. At yeah, it? exactly. Exactly. And, and then hopefully at some point, um, somebody will say that's interesting enough. Let's do it, but let's also do it. And then let's do it again and make it better. And then, you know, and over time it'll be refined. Very cool. So I have a team around that now and, and, uh, they're awesome. And, and, uh, and, and they've really helped to refine it and refine the messaging around it and things like this. So, mm -hmm. So we're, we're actually making a lot of, we've made a lot of progress over the last, uh, say six months okay. on, on sort of moving that thing forward. But, but, you know, it took, it, it's taken years to kind of really kind of that for the, as you said, crystallize for that to crystallize yeah. that sort of thing and, and kind of, kind of come to fruition. So awesome. that's, that's one process, okay. but honestly, all three of the companies, um, and we, we can talk yeah, about tell, the others. Tell me a little bit about, I know, uh, talent is another one that, uh, was kind yeah, of launched so, year, this year. <laughs> so talent is kind of like, uh, talents, my, 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 my favorite child, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, for me personally, I mean, it's, it's, uh, so, uh, as, as I mentioned, I, I had built up this uh, company, uh, back in the early two thousands mm -hmm. that I sold and, but, but while I was, I, I have a tendency and anybody listening to this can probably tell, I have a tendency to kind of have a very, uh, academic mindset or, you know, things like this. And my, uh, my fiance, um, uh, she's very nice to me and she, she very nicely says that I'm loquacious is, <laughs> is the words that she uses. But, um, you know, I, I, uh, so, so, but, but when I was, when I had that company, um, back and this was in 2003, um, it was, we were spitting out, like we had these models and simulations and such like this, but the output of these things kind of looked like that scene in the matrix, you know, with all the symbols and the numbers and all those sort of things, like nobody in their right mind could possibly understand the output. Right. Yeah. So, so we had to create a consultant consulting like wing of the company to kind of interpret and then present these things. Mm -hmm. Uh, Help people to, flange up to, to the, clients the, and 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 and, and and turn them into um, sort of an actionable plan and things like that. Yeah. So as part of that, uh, we had this consultancy uh, or this consulting wing, and and it didn't just do that. It, it ended up doing some consulting work um, and various companies. And there was this, uh, and uh, there was a there was a startup, not, not startup is not the right word, a, a small software company okay. uh, in Chicago. And uh, they they called us in to do this organizational design project, a management consulting project. And uh, at the time that we started the project, um, the the company was had thirty people. Three months later, when we finished the project, the company had fifty people. Wow! Massive growth in a very short period of time. So the CEO took me took me to lunch one day toward the end of this, and he says, Neil, um, I uh, have this uh, problem. Um, I am trying to, uh, we're, we're growing rapidly. We need to grow our workforce rapidly and I'm, we're hiring a bunch of people. And I feel like these people are very good 
fits for the job. They, they're good skills mm. fits for the jobs. But I don't feel like they're necessarily all the best fit culturally and strategically, like long-term fits for us um, and what we want to build a foundation of the business around. Um, and do you know of any tools out there or methods for us to be able to hire more efficiently? Mm. His name's Jake. And I said, I said, Jake, I don't off the top of my head, but let me, uh, let me go do a little bit of research and, and, and come back. So this is 2003. So, you know, Google was a thing, but it wasn't, you know, as big as it is now. Right. right? right. So Not you had to like, effective. yeah. So, so I went and I, w- I went and looked around. I, d- I did do a Google search, I recall. And I looked around and I, and, and, uh, I remember it was a Monday when we first had that lunch conversation and it was a Thursday when we were going to have our next conversation and Wednesday night, I'm like, well, I guess that's it. I, I don't have anything. There's nothing to show him or to tell him or anything like this. So, so I go to sleep and I wake up the next morning and I had an idea and I kind of pondered on it in the shower and I went into uh, his office the, the next, that, that morning. And he says, uh, he says, so, you know, did you get a chance to think on this problem or do you have any t- you know, tools and resources that I could use? And I said, I said, I, I, I don't have anything. I don't, I didn't find anything, but I have an idea. And if you're willing to give it a go, this goes back to like, you know, just putting something give out there, try. right? Being vulnerable about it and such like this. And, and he's, I said, if, if, you, uh, if you're willing to give it a go, I think it'd be a good idea. I think it's something that would work for you. He said, well, what's the idea? And I said, well, right now you and everybody else on the planet uses a resume. And it's a backward look into what uh, people have, have done, mm-hmm. what their accomplishments have been and such like this. But, you know, there, there, there's this joke. I, I've, I've learned this since. I'm not really an HR guy. And, and so there's this joke in, in HR circles that I found. I don't know if it's everybody in HR. <laughs> it might be the five people I've talked to. <laughs> so, but but, but they, they told me this joke. And the joke is, is that, you know, there's an interviewer um, and an interviewee. And the interviewer says, so where do you see yourself in five years? And the interviewee looks back at them and says, uh, celebrating the fifth anniversary of you asking me that question. <laughs> and so, but like a lot of times in these interviews, like it's just an inane set of questions, but right. really what they want is, is the same thing. They, they, they want the interviewee or the, the, the candidate to, to be able to express what is it that um, you want to do yeah. and, and how can that align with what the company's trying to do and, um, and, and how can we work best to develop the company and to develop the business and to develop you. Right. Exactly. That and, 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 and both sides of that conversation want that thing. They might want it slightly differently, but they want it. Yeah. And so this is what I told Jake is I said, I said, you know, you, you use these resumes. Everybody uses these resumes. But why don't you just add, why don't we just ask them to fill out what I called a forward looking resume? And, and I'm not the first person in the world to have come up with this idea. Uh, uh, but but why, why don't you come, you know, sort of get them to fill out a forward looking resume? And what we'll do is we'll structure it. Uh, just like a resume, hmm. you know, it'll have an experience section and it'll have like a summary section and all this sort of stuff. Why don't we do that? And then that way your hiring managers, your HR, your recruiters, et cetera, will have an easy time of reading it because it'll look like something that they're accustomed right. to, but it'll give the candidates um, an opportunity to express themselves and also do research about your company and figure out. And what I told him is I said, here's my opinion on how this might work. The content what they say will tell you whether or not they're a good strategic fit. Hmm. How they say it will tell you if they're a good cultural fit. In terms of word choice. So word choice, structure. style, et cetera, yep. et cetera. This, is the, this was the hypothesis behind this. And he says, I love it. Let's try it. Hmm. So developed the template. He went off and used it. And like a month later, he calls me back and he says, he says this was really wonderful. Thank you for doing this. And then for about 16 years until 2019, I just gave this away. Like I just I literally had a PDF and I was like giving it to friends and family you know, that right. kind of thing. <laughs> and so, uh, and so, but then in, uh, October, 2019, um, uh, another client of mine, a former client of mine, um, came to me and we sat down and, and, uh, he says, he, waiter takes our order. We're sitting down to dinner and he, he takes our order walks away and and uh my my client my former client says his name is uh gary so gary says neil i gotta tell you something i gotta tell you something i gotta ask you something i said okay 
He says, the first thing he says, he says, he said, that consulting project you did for us, that was great. It was good. And we're still doing that stuff. But that forward looking resume template, we're, we're still using that. We're using it for our employees. Mm. We're using it for our hires. It has propelled us to the top of our industry. And I said, I said, well, that's wonderful, Gary. You know, like that's, that's great to hear. I'm really happy for you. And I said, and you had a question? And he says, yeah. Why the fuck aren't you like productizing this thing? Like selling <laughs> to everybody. You across the face like, yeah. come on, Neil. Yeah. And, he, and, 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 I'm, and I'm like, I don't know, Gary. I mean, I've been busy. <laughs> and, you know, sort of, <laughs> and he says, Neil, you got to do this. You got to sell this thing to the world. Yeah. He said, companies across the board will, 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 will need this. And you've got to refine process, refined over many, many years. Yeah. A bunch, says, a bunch of use cases, a bunch of use cases, yeah. know how to use it and know how to implement it, know how to like build services around it, et cetera, et cetera. He says, so, so he says, you got to do this. And I said, well, I'll think about it. He said, just do me a favor. Don't sell it to any of my competitors. <laughs> and I like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm okay. I'm okay with that. And a few months later, um, I pulled together a team, which, um, you know, I, I have a great team, uh, on this, but, but one of the people that I want to kind of highlight here is, uh, one of my co-founders on this, his name is uh, Michael Powell. And the reason I'm highlighting him in, in this conversation sure. is because uh, Michael uh, was, was actually the original co-founder with me on this deal. Um, and uh, he, uh, he's a cultural anthropologist. He has a PhD from Rice. Um, and he, uh, he has worked as a business anthropologist for 15 so, or so years, something yeah. like this. He consults with uh, companies on their culture, on their experience, on all this sort of things. And I, I, t I went to him and I said, look, if, I'm, if we're going to do this, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it with you because I need somebody who has, I mean, I have, I have a master's degree in economics and things like this, but economics isn't like a normal social science, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's kind of the redheaded stepchild of social sciences. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I said, look, I need somebody who really understands the social science literature. I want to ground this in like data and I want to ground it in like a, a solid understanding of, uh, of, of society, of humanity, of, of individuals and, and all these sort of things. So let, help me to refine this. And so that's what we're doing. Um, that, and that's how that came about. Uh, so what we're doing is we're taking that tool, we've digitized it, virtualized it. Um, and it's a simple thing. In fact, one of my other co-founders who happens to be uh, my oldest friend, um, he, uh, he was, he used to be the, um, uh, director of workforce analytics at, at John Deere. Mm. And he came down here to, uh, to be a part of all of this. And, uh, and, but, but when he came down, he saw it for the first time. He saw the tool for the first time. And he looks, and he's like, so it's just a bunch of text boxes. <laughs> and I said, well, I said, well, yeah, but you know, it's what we do with the text boxes. Yeah, that right, matters. Right. <laughs> and so, so that's, uh, that's kind of how, how talent came about. But what we're doing with that is we, we've got a tool, uh, which is this form essentially. And then uh, we've virtualized it and we've got uh, analytics around it and services around it. So, so we're trying to like take that to market. Um, and eventually, uh, yeah, we will do what Gary kind of like slapped me across the face and, and said we should do, which is to properly productize it, meaning build a standalone product around it and, and then, you know, um, expand on its usage and, and, and things like this. And I will tell, I'll tell you, and, and you know, in the context of this being uh, sort of about uh, creativity and uh, and and uh, intellectualism and stuff like this, I will tell you that, and, and we were talking about mission, yeah. And I'll say that, uh, you know, I don't know if it's properly referred to as a mission or to as a as a vision or a purpose, but but sure. something around there, the that for talent is to enable every person to become the best version of themselves as they see it. And the way that I think that this fits into that is that. I just, I want, I want everybody in the world going back, this kind of goes back to the same entrepreneur conversation about entrepreneurialism. Uh, I want everybody in the world to have, I think that there's four things that everybody needs to be able to do and become who they want to be. They need to have awareness of the possibilities and themselves. They need to have access to opportunities. Then they need to be able to take advantage of the opportunities. And then the fourth thing is they need to have the resources to be able to do all of that, yeah. right? And then and and to express themselves, and and that's that's essentially sort of like the approach that talent is taking. Now we're not doing all of that right now, but eventually the the goal here is to build all of that out for I, in my vision of this for every single person on the planet. Yeah, and I think that if we can do that, I don't care. I mean people have said, well, wow, that could be a billion dollar opportunity, sure. you know? And I'm like, oh, you know, I'm, I don't care about the dollars. 
the success of talent is measured in the people that we serve. So if, if you told me that we were serving, that we were making billions of dollars, but we were serving 100 people, I'd be very disappointed. Sure. I'd also be kind of curious about that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, or even hundreds of thousands of people or even millions of people. But if you told me that we weren't making a lot of money, but we were making enough money to sustain ourselves, mm -hmm. but serving billions of people, then that to me would be far more interesting. Yeah. Um, and that, that's sort of the goal. There. Awesome. But, but as, as, as you know, that, that's that, but the, the origin story in the yeah. context of like comic books and superheroes and these sorts of things <laughs> in the world, um, the, the origin story of talent was a very, very different one from Solver X. Yeah. Um, Solver X came like, it, they both were grounded in, I think the problem, but, but, but the, uh, but how they evolved, how they came to be, um, and, and what their story is going forward, yeah. uh, are, are very different. From so awesome. Really cool. Um, we've used our time really well. We've got a few more minutes. I wanted sure. to, so I kind of want to leave it open to you, just kind of open-ended question. Like if there's anything else that you want to talk about, whether it's another company or uh, a few, th anything that you want to leave the audience with? I should probably mention the other company yeah, because let's do otherwise it. my partners in that company are going to be jealous. Or yeah, something please, like let's, that. let's bring it up. <laughs> so uh, the, the last one is called uh, uh, Village Insights. And, yeah. and Village Insights actually, uh, so this kind of goes back to how uh, ideas kind of come to fruition um, and what their origin story is as well. But it's a very different story. So Village Insights uh, didn't come about, I, 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 I'm not the... Uh, I wasn't the originator of the concept of Village Insights. Sure. I'm not the principal founder, if you will, or anything like this of Village Insights. That person is uh, Mike Francis. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if I if I recall the, the the details of the story, and and Mike, forgive me if uh, if I got some of this wrong, <laughs> but uh, but you know, Mike was um, you know he was uh, in a kind of a technology and strategy role at NOV. Um, and was looking around at like you know kind of innovation management uh, at NOV. Um, and software, innovation management software and things like this. And he's like, you know, most of the stuff out there just isn't great. Mm. So after he left NOV and, and maybe some time later, um, he started, Mike, Mike has a, if I, if I understand correctly, if I recall correctly, he has a bachelor's in computer science from A&M. And uh, so he, you know, he is like, he, he's like, I haven't coded in a long time, but you know, I'm going to try to build something. And he started building something and he just took, he took uh, sort of three years Mm. uh nights and weekends just doing this and the only person that knew about this was his wife um and then uh back in uh late 2019 he uh he approached me and he and I were friends and uh he just was like look you know i know you kind of understand the business of these things could you tell me a little bit what we look at this and just kind of tell me if i have something here i said well yeah i think i think this is a good start and uh, I think that it could become something, uh, but here's here's some things that I think you can change, and here's how I think you can, you know, some ideas around how to build a business around it. And he says, "Great, you want to come join me on this?" <laughs> and, and I said, "I said, you know, I've got two other companies I'm working on, and I can't really commit to uh, doing this, uh, you know, sort of full time, but I'm happy to help you with it, and and uh, happy to help you build a team around it because that's really what it takes. It's it's and no no person can do this by themselves. I don't care, you know. I mean, you know, yeah." I get it. There's the stories of like Jeff Bezos and, you know, him sitting in his garage and, you know, doing this thing. And, sure. but, but the truth of the matter is it's not one person. It's never one person, right? right? You know, right. it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it takes, it, it takes an entire group of people. This goes back to that humility is knowing, um, who, uh, you know, who you are, what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are, and then surrounding yourself, uh, with people, um, who can uh, be very effective at that? At that, I, I know that this is uh, you know some, somewhat targeted um, in the sort of around carbon and uh, energy and such like this. And here's what it comes down to: uh, you need to surround yourself with the right people. And sometimes you're the person that is uh, part of the team that's surrounding someone else. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're the person who's surrounding themselves with somebody else. Yeah. You know, and and, it, and none of that matters. We all have our role to play. Um, and we all have strengths and, and weaknesses and, and, uh, you know, part of the, 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 so what, what Village Insights is, is it's a, it's essentially an innovation management platform, but it's not directed solely at corporations. Unlike all other, as far as I know, innovation management platforms that are out there, um, it also has a, a, a connectivity, um, like a, like a broader public connectivity component to it. So, 
Uh, it's it's uh, it enables uh, you know like you can have what we call a citadel mm -hmm. um, in this like open world environment. So you can think of it how the full connectivity of uh, like a Facebook or a LinkedIn or something like this could be just, you know seamless digital connectivity um, across the world. Um, but also uh, allows, and it, it, that's what we call the digital mesh, um, is 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 the term that we use. So um, it's uh, and then and then, but but it also allows you, uh, a, for example, a corporation to build what we call a citadel in this open world. So that's a secured um, environment in which uh, things can happen behind the walls of the citadel uh, that are protected and secured, and there's privacy and such like this around that. But they can also kind of like let the drawbridge down and they can go out and venture out into the into the world into these other villages some of which are public and such like this and 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 converse and um collaborate and connect with uh, other individuals that are not necessarily part of the same company and sure. and that's that's the idea behind village insights is is to do this around these villages is what we call them and it's, it's basically just uh virtualizing the entire human experience which is you know how we build community and how we connect with one another and um and 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 the, and the amazing things that that can happen as a, as a consequence of that but our team and how village insights came to be was itself a story of a village um mike francis kind of had this idea and he's he's like like in houston you know we had the allen brothers and they landed on this like swampy land and they kind of started building this thing and then what is now you know this massive city of seven and a half million people and mike francis sort of had this idea and he landed on the the swampy land of this 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 concept and uh and 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 he said he said you know but i need i need other people to can help me with this and and they're going to contribute and maybe in the end this thing is going to look nothing like the thing that mike first built and that's okay you know, I mean, but it's a seed, it's a seed, it's a seed. And, and so long as we are, uh, focused on what the world needs and what the problems are and, or, or, or what the opportunities are that, uh, new technologies or new, uh, uh, you know, social and cultural happenings and things like this can provide for us. What, uh, then, then, and as long as we're responding to those things in a positive way, then, you know, I think that we'll be okay. And we'll be building something that, that, uh, we're, we're, you know, that organization solver X talent and village insights we're all very um uh very purpose driven very mission driven um but but the the origins of those companies are very different from one another um i mean yeah they have some common characteristics such as again being problem driven and purpose driven and stuff yeah. like this but but the actual like you know the path that these things have taken and certainly the path that they're going to take going forward um are going to be very different from each other and from anything else on, in in the world awesome Neil, this has been a really fascinating discussion. I I've, appreciate you coming out this. and taking yeah, the time. And uh, to the extent that there's some information that we can share in the show notes, we'll do that yeah. and uh, get people sort of plugged in with the things that you're working on. Yeah. Find Neil on social media, connect with him. Great guy. And thanks again for hopping on yeah, the thanks for having Carbon me. Curiosity podcast. I really appreciate this. This is great. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're doing this as well. This is <laughs> wonderful. Appreciate wonderful the support. Thing. Yeah. All absolutely. right, man. Stay well. Thanks. You too. Onward.